are greetings from Tucson. We would like to warmly thank the conference team for organizing such a thought-provoking conference and for allowing us to participate. As the Potter's Wheel is central to the operation of the Pottery Workshop, archaeologists have attempted to extract as much information as possible from the device, the user, and the finished product. In this slide, we try to capture a few of the major aspects that Wheel Research has covered and are applicable for the Greek historic and prehistorical periods. The general trends can be grouped in four major categories. First, the wheel itself. In this category, we include four subsets. First, the study of archaeological remains, mostly of wheelheads, as no entire wheel apparatus has survived from Greek antiquity. Second, the rather well-known list of two dozen or so depictions of potters working at the wheel on Athenian, Corinthian, and Boeotian ceramics. Third, a small number of Greek and Latin literary references in epics and philosophical works praising the skill and patience of ancient potters and claiming Athens and Corinth as the birthplaces of the potter's wheel. I'm highlighting here two rather famous references to the arduous wheel apprenticeship based on observation and participation method. These passages also convey successfully the well-structured framework of potters learning to proceed from smaller to larger vessels in the course of such apprenticeships. The final subset is the ever-increasing number of experimental replicas of prehistoric and historic wheels. For example, Minoan type wheels, or our classical Athenian potter's wheel. The second major category is the wheel and the finished pot. To produce a pot, multiple rotary devices and multiple forming techniques are involved. A fast wheel for throwing a pot is just one of the many possible variations. For over 20 years, scholars have worked hard on identifying marks left on a pot thrown on a wheel, situating thus the potter's wheel within the wider spectrum of rotary devices, from turntables to fast wheels. A refined terminology for capturing the various combinations of rotary surfaces and forming methods has indeed enhanced our understanding of this crucial stage and make us realize how fundamental such distinctions are. For the Greek ceramics, emphasis has been paid on the turning marks on the other side of pots for establishing the direction of in the ancient Greek wheel. The third category is the wheel and the potter. Extensive ethnographic research has focused on the use of a potter's wheel by a potter, with the use of video recordings, computer method modeling, as the statistical analysis, scholars have expanded the scope of questions to cover topics such as shape standardization, apprenticeship length and structure, or potter's adjustments to new shapes, to name just a few. The potter's responses to newly introduced shapes should be better integrated in the study of Greek decorated ceramics, where we have not fully utilized the technical skills associated with specific shapes, the potter's modified output, and the financial repercussions on the workshop. The quintessential role of the wheel in a workshop is not easily grasped where one sees the special footprint it occupies within a workshop, typically just 3% of the space, which probably explains why archaeologists rarely find the, its exact spot during excavations. This may be now a consoling fact. Finally, the wheel and the society. The wheel has served as an index of craft specialization and social complexity. 
The exact time and circumstances of its appearance in the early Bronze Age is a hotly debated top issue, precisely because of its potency to mirror the wider trends in craft production and social organization. Once it is introduced and widely adopted, then it also serves to differentiate the most complex mode of craft specialization and economic organization, especially in the prehistoric period. Shifting our attention to our current project, the Tucson Wheel Replica started in 2012 as a student project for a class on ancient Greek technology. Stefan Corsello produced a wheel 1.067 meters in height. Its wheel head measures 0.81 meters in diameter and weighs 27.8 kilograms. In fall 2017, the wheel was lowered to 0.53 meters to more accurately reflect the ancient depiction. Its frame is made of oak wood and the wheel head is made of spruce with polyutherane coating. We held two experimental sessions in 2013-2014 when Dan Pont took detailed measurements of the RPM of the wheel during specific phases. A second set of experiments was conducted in 2017, and both Dan Pond and Brandon Neff were involved as we were trying to improve both the wheel's performance and our recording methods. After reducing the height of the wheel, we collected data on its use by experienced local potters. In total, eight vessels were formed using a variety of different potter spanner configurations. The first configuration, Experienced, featured only an experienced potter who both spun the wheel and threw the vessel. In this configuration, the wet clay on the potter's hands quickly impeded their ability to grasp the wheel. The second configuration, Experienced Novice, featured an experienced potter throwing the vessel and a novice spinning the wheel. In this configuration, the potter was able to focus more on the process of throwing. However, as the novice didn't have experience with throwing pottery, he lacked the implicit understanding of the throwing process. Thus, he would often spin the wheel at inopportune times, jostling the wheel during delicate moments of the throw. The third configuration, Experienced Experienced, featured an experienced potter in both roles, one spinning and one throwing. In this configuration, the inopportune jostling was reduced, but the age, advanced age of the potters disallowed sufficient angular velocity for sustained throwing, requiring more spinning overall. While the potters were throwing vessels, two sets of data were collected. The first, described in more detail in the next section, used a tachometer to measure the rotational velocity of the wheel. The second was video footage recorded by the authors. Previous researchers have answered questions about rotation of velocity with low fidelity methods or without discussion of methods at all. Work by Amirin and Shenhov describes their experiments with replica wheels, noting that they reached a maximum rotation of velocity of 60 RPM, but they do not provide details as how to they arrived at this figure. In another study examining experimental replicas of ancient Egyptian potter's wheels, Powell gives more details about the methods used. Powell recorded the amount of time required for 50 or 60 revolutions, then divided the number of revolutions by the amount of time that took. This results in an average RPM across that time period. Another example of a lower fidelity method uh, can be found in Doherty's study of potter's wheels in ancient Egypt. Doherty uses a similar method to Powell, counting the number of revolutions and dividing by time to get an RPM. But in contrast, Doherty uses slowed down video to perform this analysis. This allows Doherty to more accurately collect those average values. However, collecting fine grain velocity data by hand is highly labor intensive. The last work that collects velocity data from wheels is the previous work on this real wheel replica. After attaching high contrast marks to the side of the wheel, uh, Dan Pont used a digital tachometer to calculate ranges of speeds for each of four sections of the throw. While this method can accurately establish wheel velocity, it has two drawbacks. First, it requires a detailed and technical, technical preparation of the wheel, where the size and placement of the con contrast marks can affect 
the method's accuracy. Secondly, it requires the use of additional equipment, namely the tachometer. We developed WheelViz to aid in collecting and visualizing velocity information for potter's wheels. While physical analysis of wheel remains and qualitative analysis of throwing is undoubtedly useful in understanding the technology and techniques of ancient potters, the value of quantitative measures cannot be ignored. Velocity and the related property of momentum are two such important measures. Faster, longer, and easier spinning wheels enable potters to produce pieces with less total labor. Thus, when studying the dissemination of technology and technique in a community of potters, these measures play an important role. WheelViz works by collecting displacement information from the user. As the user inputs displacement quantities, WheelViz calculates durations using the video timestamps, then calculates the average velocity of the wheel over the time period by dividing the displacement amount by the duration. Next, we'll show a demo. The first step to using WheelViz is to record the use of the wheel. The only strict requirement here is that the video has a mostly unobstructed view of the wheel head. It can be from any angle as, and change throughout the throw as long as the user can compensate for those changes. Again, not required, but the analysis stages are much easier if there's a high contrast mark on the wheel head, such as masking tape. The next step is to navigate to the web application site, which I already have open here. Uh, it's brandonnath.github.io slash wheel tool. It should bring you to this page. Once the web page is reached, we'll upload the file that we'll be looking at. And today we'll be looking at throw one. If the upload is successful, you should see the file chosen here. The next step is to use the N key, just holding it down, until you've reached the point of the video that you want to begin uh, the analysis. And here, we're going to start right about here at this frame. And when you've reached that desired starting point, we use the S key to start. And this marks the zero position of this recording. So then we go to the end key for next and uh, hold that down or press it individually until you've made one full rotation or more, a different amount. So this time we use one. And uh, we'll go back to holding down the end key. And we've gone a little bit over one. And here we've made 1.25 rotations since the last time we entered. So I'll type that in and go back to holding down N to get to the next one. Uh, at this point, we've made 0 0.75 rotations since our last entry. So that's what we'll enter and we'll continue. And you know, say at this point, maybe we want to get some more fine grain data. So we'll start collecting more often. Here we've gone a half of a rotation. So we'll type that in. And we've made another half of a rotation here. And about here, we've made a quarter of a rotation. And here we've made a half rotation since that last one. And maybe at this point we've, we've exited the interesting point, so we're just gonna kind of let it go. And that's two rotations this time. And we'll just let that go. One rotation, two rotations, and three rotations. So as you can see, you can change the fidelity of the information you gain uh, by changing the regularity with which you input data. So once you've done this for the entire video, um, your entire recording, we'll use the E key to export our data. And you should see uh, your CSV file, which then you can open in the editor of your choice to continue your analysis. To evaluate WheelViz, we compare its output with data collected using the tachometer method for one of the vessels created during the November 2017 throwing session. The tachometer procedure split the throw into four segments, the specific timestamps of which are not recorded. During the starting stage, velocity ranged from 71 to 74 RPM. During maintaining, 62 to 88. During finishing, 54 to 57. During smoothing, 47 to 51. This data is shown in the first graph. We used WheelViz to collect the data shown in the second two charts. Because the information was collected at a higher granularity, it paints a clearer picture of the throwing process than the tachometer method. For example, between timestamps 50 and 150 seconds, we can see a jagged shape in the, in the velocity. This correlates with the process of hand spinning the wheel. The upward segments represent where the spinner is spinning the wheel to make it go faster, while the downward segments represent the potter lifting and shaping the clay, slowing the wheel down. 
When the wheel is broken into segments and the graph is colored by the stage of the throw that is occurring, the graph is in the bottom figure is produced. Future development of WheelViz will proceed in two directions based on feedback from users. First, WheelViz will incorporate intelligent error detection to help users identify potential erroneous inputs. Intelligent error detection will be incorporated by developing a prediction system. Using information about the previously provided inputs, the system will predict a range of likely inputs, and if the user's inputs fall outside of that range, it will warn the user that their input is unusual. For example, if the wheel has been consistently moving at 60 RPM, and an input suddenly changes the speed to 120 RPM, WheelViz will warn the user of a potential error. This addition will improve the accuracy and speed of using WheelViz because it helps identify errors as soon as they happen. Second, WheelViz will incorporate context partitioning, allowing the user to break up a throw into different contexts based on relevant characteristics. Context partitioning will enable real-time context labeling for recordings, instead of having to do it in post. This functionality is best explained through the third chart on screen. Consider the question of how velocity differs across different phases of the throwing process. One might expect certain phases, like finishing, to have slower velocities than other phases, like centering. With context partitioning, the user can automatically mark different parts of the video as parts of different contexts. Then, this context data will be used to differentiate the velocity data for the different phases. Another potential use for this feature would be to study how the wheel contact changes with the Potter Spinner configuration. As we move forward with our wheel program, we have identified areas that can be further explored. For example, after carefully measuring the weight of clay lamps placed on the Tucson wheel replica, we started paying more attention on the weight of the pot while being formed on the wheel. In a project parallel to recording wheel speeds and trimmings and timings, we also weighed a small group of Greek and South Italian vessels to estimate the original mass of clay a potter had to throw on the wheel in order to form a vessel in one or several pieces. A small arrival ballast 10 centimeters tall requires at least 160 grams of clay, a large sized skiffos, about 1.36 kilograms of clay, and uh, a, a large crater and almost one meter in height requires an astounding amount of 24 kilograms of clay. This weight is after the neck, handles, and foot are joined together. If using the off the hand technique, the potter could center a larger mass of clay on the wheel, for example, three kilograms, and throw about 10 to 15 aribaloi. Another aspect is time. Time is always of essence. It will be extremely useful to develop a data set of time requirements to produce certain basic shapes from the prehistoric and historic times. I provide here one set of time requirements, courtesy of a Japanese potter who had limited exposure to throwing Greek shapes. Jeffra's detailed videos for specific shapes can be a very valuable resource. Such estimates would help us better gauge the annual production of Greek ceramics, a perennially thorny topic in the scholarship, which relies mostly on the estimated survival rate of decorated ceramics and on the annual production rate of distinguishable vase painters. The ever-expanding field of wheel research can definitely benefit from interdisciplinary approaches. We hope that the fine-grained information on the wheel's performance through the study of its velocity and the wheel visa application can complement current research programs which focus on the potter's hand positions over time or on the shape contour of the vessel during the forming phase. An equilibrium of emphasis on the potter, the pot, and the wheel will help us better understand their interdependence. Thank you.